Firstly, thanks for coming back after lunch. I really do appreciate it. Um, did you, where did you go? Did you go to the nice shipping containers over there? Ah, yeah. oh, lovely, isn't it? It's lovely, Bristol, for that. Yeah, I'm a Bristolian, so I'm proud of my city. So thank you, if you're not from Bristol, for coming. If you're from Bristol, you get what I mean. <laughs> so a bit about me, yeah, as Oliver mentioned then, I've not been doing this for 30 years. That would mean I started when I was about 10 years old. I've been doing it for about 13. Um, and in fact, let's show hands. Here's some stuff I've watched recently. Have you ever bought a Raspberry Pi? You bought a Raspberry Pi? Yeah, hands up. Anybody on the GIFGAF mobile phone network? Yeah, any of you been to the Museum of Modern Art in New York? Yeah, uh, there's more of you than on GIFGAF. That's interesting to see. <laughs> Some sort of brand stuff. I get, I'm just getting a feel for the room now. All right, so you've, you've all worked on something that I designed and worked on in the last year or so. So as Oliver mentioned, I've worked previously with people like Disney, worked on their European redesign, eBay for a while, Microsoft, loads of other people. Um, yeah, and I'm a Bristolian, and I'm based here, which is lovely. All right, so today I'm going to talk to you about this, which is I'm going to talk to you about a framework for product design around psychology. So to help you use psychology to build better digital products, so websites and apps. And we'll talk about a couple of strategies to evaluate a website and two ways to design a website, one based around interaction design, so the details, and one around the user experience, taking a big step back and going, what are we trying to achieve here? And we'll use psychology to talk about that. And so my background, my background is pretty much within three things. So I spend about a third of my time doing user research, about a third doing what I quite grandly call, what I call it, I've got a product direction. Sometimes I call it product strategy, which sounds a bit grand. Just getting people to do the right things in the right order. That's basically what I do with my life these days. And I occasionally roll up my sleeves and I do some design work. Um, you saw some of these books earlier on, um, Researching UX... Um, analytics, designing UX forms, and designing UX prototyping. I am the series editor alongside Simon from SitePoints, who's here, um, in producing these user experience books. So I helped kind of figure out what to write and help the authors to write them as well. They're a really good series of UX books if you are interested in getting started with some UX stuff. Um, I also wrote, anybody, this is my book, anybody bought this book? Oh, well done. <laughs> it's only like £2.50. Did you read it, though? That's the question. Did you buy it? And have you read it? No, nobody's read it. Right, I don't mind, to be honest. <laughs> I ain't bothered. I mean, as long as you buy it, that's fine. Uh, all right, okay. So, let's go. Enough about me. Let's start talking about this talk. So, I've got a question for you. Um, in October 2011, Dubai police noted a 20% drop in car accidents. In Abu Dhabi, it was 40%. Okay? Why? Why? Why would nobody be driving? It's not hot, no. I'll drive no matter what in that part of the world. If you know anything about cars, they are big motorheads in that part of the world. Well, you are slow after lunch. Nobody said, nobody said Ramadan. It wasn't Ramadan. I'll tell you what, here's why. So there's a huge drop. 40% drop in car accidents was down to one thing, and one thing going down, and that was Blackberry. Remember Blackberry? Um, Blackberry went down for 48 hours in 2011 in October. 40% reduction, right, in car accidents. What does that tell you about what people are doing when they're driving? <laughs> yeah, um, that's the problem. This is the problem that we're all facing when we're designing and digital stuff, is people are doing something else when they're using your things. Hopefully, when they're using your apps and websites, they're not driving. Um, if they are, well, unless you're a GPS provider, which is probably okay, we're in a good place. But again, what that tells us is that people are really bad at doing two things at once. Really, really bad at it. So, the problem. Uh, this is a famous soap opera. Uh, this is The Rover's Return from Coronation Street. Um, I'm sorry I've got a more Bristol option. I was trying to think of an equivalent Bristol show to The to, uh, Rover's Return to Coronation Street. And I, I couldn't think of one. Any Bristol TV shows? Skins. skins. <laughs> yeah, could have had some skins in there. It's quite difficult to get a screenshot from skins that isn't somebody drinking, smoking, or doing something they shouldn't be doing. Yeah, skins is a good one. Anyway, so... This is on about seven, no, between 7 and 8.30, two or three nights a week. And what is the number one thing people are doing when they're watching Coronation Street? Having a cup of tea. Having a cup of tea, yeah. It's funny, I gave this talk in Europe a few weeks ago, and they, they, they mentioned a number of things before they mentioned tea. I love you, Brits. <laughs> uh, <laughs> having a cup of tea, they might be doing that. No. Texting? Texting, yeah, a little bit iPhones, yeah. So people are on their tablet or their iPhone while the TV is on. And something, this is crazy statistic, about half of all smartphone and tablet owners use these devices while watching TV, which means you guys all do as well, don't you? We're all doing this. 
adverts start, you're in it, before you know it, you're sort of two thirds into part two of the soap opera and you've really not got any idea what's going on. You do sound familiar to you? No, some of you are shaking your heads. Oh, you're good people, aren't you? <laughs> good people. Most people in the real world do this sort of stuff. Not that you're not in the real world. I'm going to shut up. You get the point. All right. And this is one of the things that we're really bad at as humans is we're distracted. Okay? We cannot do two things at the same time. We simply cannot multitask. Okay? The Abu Dhabi traffic figure shows that people think they can multitask, but the reality is, is that traffic road accidents happen, not because we're on our... Um, not because we're bad drivers, but because simply we're using BlackBerry or our mobile phones when we're driving. We are awful at multitasking as humans, okay? You think you're good at it, you're almost certainly not. There's a crazy statistic that says something like, it reduces your cognitive capacity by 50% just by doing two things at the same time. So if you're surfing the internet while listening to a podcast, 50% reduction, all right? Incredible amount of stuff gets dropped if we're trying to do two things at the same time. So just stop. Um, but the problem is, is our users aren't going to stop and the, our users are doing things while they're using our apps and our stuff. Um, okay, number two. This is a, uh, can you all see this by the way? Hands up if you can't see it and I'll explain it to you, right, you can't see it. Some one chap over here, that's the lecterns right in the way. Um, this is a graph that shows, um, it's from a, a study that was done in Israel. So they, did a, they went back and they looked at judicial decisions in courts. And they looked at how lenient the judge was, and they put that along the axis of time of the day, which is wonderful. And guess when judges were more lenient? After lunch. After, lunch. after breakfast and after lunch, judges were more lenient. What does that tell you about justice? <laughs> Scary, isn't it? It tells me, if you ever get done for a car conviction because you've been using your BlackBerry while driving, make sure you get a court date that's just after lunch, and you're probably going to be all right. But yeah, what it tells us is that people make bad decisions when they're tired and when they are hungry. All right? We can't help that. Again, thinking about the product you're working on. When are people using your website? If you're a travel company, chances are they're using your website at when? What's the most common time for a travel company for people to use their website? Lunchtime. Hate your job. Want a bit of escapism. Oh, I'll get on there and have a look. Maybe you're eating a sandwich. Maybe you're not. Again, cognitive capacity is lower when we are hungry. Again, not rocket science, but again, stuff we forget when we're designing the things we're looking at. Looking at your stats based on usage can tell you how alert people are going to be. If you're lucky enough to be a website that people are using great, you know, at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, you're golden. You don't have to worry about this stuff. But if people are using this 4 or 5 o'clock in the evening, just before lunch, you need to watch those stats and design for that stuff. So, you no, know, tiredness and hunger is a real problem. And it leads to situations and issues like that, like this, which is, I'm tired, I've had a hard day at work, the last thing I want to do is my car insurance. Now, I did some work a few years ago for um, Money Supermarket, and uh, we were redesigning their car insurance policy, and this is what we heard, is people were like, car insurance. Anybody here work in insurance? No, good, I can carry on dissing car insurance. It's not the most exciting thing for most of our users. I find it incredibly exciting. I love working on forms projects, but I'm a forms geek. But our users don't enjoy this stuff. Their tax returns, they find that really dull. Anything that involves large amounts of data entry on a form for something they feel is a task, they hate. And the last thing they want to do when they're tired and they're hungry is do a complicated car or home insurance policy. Okay? If you work for banks, you'll know that financial transactions typically happen in the evenings when people are tired and they're hungry. But hey, wait, I hear you ask. I know the psychology. I've got some help here. People are low on motivation. I know some psychology that can help. Anybody know this thing? Maslow's hierarchy of need? Familiar with this? Ever seen this from a creative director's pitch deck? Almost certainly he was wearing orange Crocs, had some glasses with very thick frames, and probably those cords that hold the glasses around the back of their neck. Creative directors love this stuff, especially creative directors who are men who are in their 50s, because this is Maslow's hierarchy of need. Guess who... Maslow was. Maslow was a gentleman in his 50s from America, creative background. The big thing about Maslow's hierarchy of need is Maslow's hierarchy of need was based on one test subject. Do you think, who do you think that test subject was? Yeah, Maslow. And so Maslow's hierarchy of need is often pulled out by uh, middle class white men to say, this is what people want, self-actualization. And again, what's been interesting is there have been a lot of studies done Again, no clear evidence for Maslow. Loads of studies have been done around the world to look at, is this true in different cultures? Reality is, no, it's not. 
The elements that Maslow seemed and deemed important were great for, again, men, white, middle-aged men in their 50s in the United States of America, but that's not most of us in the rest of the world. But again, it's a, it's a psychology study that's stuck. So again, when you're looking for psychology, don't just read other people's pitch decks. Oh, God, please just don't read other people's pitch decks. Don't take stuff at face value, question it. I've got a whole series of these that are in my book, which is Besting Myths of, uh, of Crappy Psychology that's used in design. Um, so go and obviously buy my book. Okay, don't, again, don't care if you read it, but it's in there if you want to. So motivation is a bit of a problem. So let's talk about motivation. How can we help people feel motivated and to get better at what they do? Let's take another uh, common situation. Wow, slightly common situation. Here is a, this is a very clever scientific study that was done by a group of psychologists in the United States of America. And they set up a stall to sell jam. And uh, on alternate Saturdays, they, they were selling six types of jam. And the following Saturday, they were selling 30 types of jam. Six, 30, they did this for a few weeks. Which of the two Saturdays do you think they sold the most jam? When there were six choices or when there were 30 choices? Six. You guys, are, you're good. You're really good. Absolutely, completely right. What the best thing was about this study, though, is they also cleverly did a survey. And they asked people, they said, dear customer, would you prefer to choose from six types of jam or 30 types of jam for your jam needs? What do you think pretty much unanimously most customers said they wanted to choose from? Six or 30? 30. Absolutely. Right. Stop doing surveys to understand your user experience. If you ask people what they want, people are dreadful, absolutely awful at telling you what they want to do. Okay, so you might be there, you're there, you're sat with your product team. Yeah, so what, we, what should we do? How many products should we have on the homepage? Six or 30? I know. Let's ask a survey. Let's ask our users what they think and what they want. People are really bad at telling you why and how they behave. Okay, and this study is a simple way to stop you doing surveys in the future. I mean, why do people on digital teams do surveys? Why? It's easy. It's data, it's big numbers generally. You can get some good data and do some statistical significance, which is always impressive. What else? Yeah. Bust assumptions. Bust assumptions, yeah. What, what, else, what else is good about surveys? Expensive or is it? It's cheap. It's cheap, it's quick, it's easy, and you get numbers. That's why surveys are there, all right? Not because they give definitively good results, because they're quick, they're easy, and they're cheap. It's not the best user research method to use. But don't worry, we've got a bit of psychology that can come here and tell you. You don't even need to do these surveys to ask what people want. You don't even have to do the user research to figure this stuff out. And instinctively, you all know the answer to this stuff because you've got asked that question exactly right about six types of jam. So this is a wonderful piece of psychology by a gentleman called uh, Hicks et al. He measured the number of options people are offered and the time take, it takes them to respond or to choose from each of those individual options. This is called, in psychology, wonderfully, Hicks Law. And Hicks Law helps you predict the number of options um, you're going to offer, how long it's going to take people to choose from those number of options that you've given them. All right, wonderful. Best thing about Hicks Law? Very good. It doesn't just apply to, it does apply to everybody. The best thing about Hicks Law is it's a law. All right? Anytime you're in a design meeting and say, right, well, Hicks law tells us to do this. Nobody is going to argue with a law if you enact the law in your design or your product meeting. It's a wonderful, wonderful way to advocate better design and better choices. Because again, you know six is better than 30. Here's a law to back up that justification. And if people don't believe you, you can break out this bad boy here, which is a wonderful bit of mathematics with a logarithmic element to it. No idea what it means, but oh, you're going to sound intelligent when you put that up on the whiteboard. Great stuff, okay? That's the great thing about Hicks Law, is it's a law. And what this brings us to is this idea that within psychology, you've probably heard this talked about a lot, which is cognitive load. What cognitive load simply is, is a definition for thinking, reasoning, and deciding. And all of those things are really, really difficult if we are tired, if we are hungry, if we're not motivated. All of this stuff becomes doubly, triply hard and the cognitive load is increased. Again, next time you want to sound intelligent in a meeting, say, oh, I don't think this new redesign has a particularly low cognitive load. It's definitely got a high cognitive load, that choice you've made there. You're going to sound really intelligent. And people are going to go, oh, yeah, maybe I should change that. It's a great way to talk about how difficult or easy it is to use your design. So again, the fourth thing we need to think about when we're designing is around choice. If we're designing for distraction, for 
tiredness and hunger for motivation and choice, we're going to be in a better position. And all of these four things taken together lead us to these particular problems. It leads to stuff like this. This is an actual quote I've had from user research. I want to punch this website in the face. Okay? We hear this. This is the frustration that our users are talking about. When we offer them too much choice, they're tired, they're hungry, they're distracted by who knows what's going on in their life, be it kids screaming in the background, Coronation Street on in the background, driving down the highway in a Ferrari at 70 miles an hour, whatever's going on, this is the frustration that our users feel. And it leads to unfortunate, difficult situations about the products we work in. Again, back to the money supermarket example I gave earlier on, is I heard this, my car insurance is through Money Saving Market, I think, or Sheila's Wheels or something. The one, yeah, the one with the opera guy. Money supermarkets spend £2 million a month on um, display advertising on Google alone. They spend around about £50 million a year on advertising, and this is what we heard in some user research. Okay? Dreadful situation, but that's the problem in the world that we're working in. People don't remember our stuff because of all of these problems they've got with being hungry, distracted, too much choice. It ends up meaning that our brand gets pushed back because people don't remember this stuff because they're just not engaged. Really, really difficult, challenging situation we've got to deal with. And it brings us to a you know, further problem. So we think, well, maybe we should do some user research. This is a, a fantastic user research study that was done um, back in the 1920s at the Hawthorne factory in, um, in Chicago. And they had this idea that, right, we're going to test a number of factors to see what increases productivity in our factory. So think about it as being a very, very early multivariant A-B test. And they uh, looked at the luminosity of, a, um, of the lights within this particular um, factory. And their hypothesis was, if we you know, lower light, people are going to do less work. They'll be less productive. So they got some scientists in, in white coats with clipboards to stand there and measure the benchmark of 100% lighting of productivity. Reduce the lighting to 80%. Oh, same productivity. Interesting. 60%. Oh, same. 40%. Oh, interesting. That's the same. 20 What? 5% luminosity, productivity was still exactly the same. Why? Yeah, there are lots of scientists in white coats with clipboards watching the workers do their work. If somebody stood behind you with a clipboard in a white coat, what, what do you think, how are you going to operate? You're going to operate differently? Of course you are. You're going to think, how much they say, oh, we're not testing you, we're testing the website stroke factory process we're working on. People don't believe you. All right? Which means that we get to the situation where we're running user research in these situations which are not unlike the Hawthorne factory. So we can't measure distraction. We can't measure tiredness. Because again, anybody who comes into user research station has probably had some chocolate and some cake and some tea before they've sat down. They're getting 40 pounds for being there that day. They're getting an awful lot of great stuff. So it's very, very hard for us to test this stuff in the real world. And psychology needs to give us a way to improve this. So here's something I'm working on. It's not quite ready yet. Um, but it's a way, it's a walkthrough, and it's an evaluation method using psychology to understand how well your product is doing. So we go through it, and we look at every single situation and interaction that's going on, and we go, all right, how can we, what, what is going on? What's the problem here? What could we do better? It's coming later in the year, because it needs a bit of work. Um, but basically, effectively, it talks about this idea of our total cognitive capacity is, is 100. So super, 100%, full of energy, really ready to go, rather like you are now. Fully fed, fully happy. That was a joke, by the way. That job went really, really badly, didn't it? Um, we start with 100. So we, we start to take stuff away. Is the TV on in the background? Yeah, take 20 points off. So again, if we know that our users are going to be watching TV while they're doing the stuff we're doing, again, if we've got a high mobile audience that are using our stuff in the evening, guaranteed they're watching the TV while they're doing it. Um, is it before a mealtime? Looking at our stats, what time of the day people are using this stuff? Take 10 points off if it's before a mealtime. Does the user have notifications turned on on their phone? If they do, again, if you've ever done user research on people's actual mobile phones, especially I did a project, project with Bristol University recently, um, and the students' not notifications on their phones were going off continually, and they were like, getting distracted all the time. Kids, I know, eh? But um, we're all the same. We've all got notifications turned on on our phone. If notifications are turned on, the cognitive capacity of our users is already down. So be careful when you ask for notifications. Don't over-notify people, folks. We're part of the problem here. And how many choices are they offered on arrival? So how many choices are they offered on the first time they land on the web app you're working on? Okay? And you take five points per, per choice. And effectively what that gives us is this idea that if we start with 100, 
typically, most of our users are operating at their best at 40%, and the cognitive load for our product is 60%. All right? That tells us how diminished the attention span is of our users. And again, if we're running regular user research in a lab, we're never going to get to the root of this stuff. But hopefully, the work through that I talked about here will get us there. Oh, it's quite depressing, isn't it? I've just probably depressed the hell out of you there, haven't I? Yeah, all your work's awful. Nobody wants to use it. They're all watching Coronation Street or driving their Ferrari down the highway. Sorry. Let's talk about some ways you can do a new psychology to improve on that stuff, okay? So some of these things and some of these ideas can help you, number one, redesign the interactions we're working on, which we'll talk about now, and the user experience. All right, so let's talk about the first one then. So the first one, I want to talk about psychology and interaction design. And I'll talk, take the example of this wonderful website. Do you recognize this? Can you see it? It's a bit blurred. This is Wikipedia. <laughs> And this is Wikipedia from 2010. In fact, it's, I know, it's Reese Witherspoon's birthday because she's featured on the homepage. Um, Legally Blonde, anybody like that movie? Great film. One of the best law movies he's ever made. Uh, Legally Blonde 2 is yeah, lacking slightly. But yeah, great film. I really like Reese Witherspoon. Anyway, sorry, Reese Witherspoon. I'm getting sidetracked here. This is Wikipedia from 2010. And Wikipedia from 2010 has got a, a bit of a design abomination. It's down here. Bottom left and the left-hand side, if you can't see the screen, don't worry if you can't. So bottom left-hand side in the column is the search box. And here is the beauty that is the search box. All right, you're all laughing, yeah? This is awful, isn't it? Why is it awful? So it's got two buttons. It's got a search box with a text box here. It's got two buttons, one of which says go, one of which says search. Two buttons, go and search. What's the problem with having two buttons? Choice, yeah, I mean, um, what's the difference between go and search? Um, uh, go, in this case, takes you directly to the page. If I take Reese Witherspoon in there, go would take me directly to Reese Witherspoon's page. Search would take me to all of Reese Witherspoon's wonderful back catalogue of movies to give me a list of the search results. That's the difference between the two, all right? Again, I'm very good at explaining that because I've had a, a good chance to explain that quite a few times. It's not an easy thing to get or to understand. The positioning of it in the bottom left-hand side of the corner is dreadful, all right? And again, instinctively, like the 6 versus 30, you all know this is wrong, yeah? This is wrong. We get that. But some designer made that choice at some point to put that thing there. All right. How can psychology help? So, remember back to school, oh, school, and learning the points of a compass. I was pretty good at these two, north and south, right? Got that one fine, okay? I live in an area of Bristol called Eastern. Anybody here from Eastern? Ah, uh, yeah, hello, Eastern Massive. There's three of us here. Um, Eastern is in the east of the Bristol. I still, have to, I still can't, with a, with a compass, tell, remember exactly which one's east and west. Is that east? Is that east? Oh, no. How do you remember which way the compass points go? Yeah, there we go. Never eat shredded wheat. This is the way that we are taught in the UK. We isn't one of the US. It's a good one. But this is how we remember difficult things, okay? So knowing the difference between east and west and north and south is remembering facts. Facts, as humans, we struggle to remember. We're really bad at this stuff. So we create and move facts into ideas like this. This is called a mnemonic, where we, we, we build a structure around the facts to help us better remember them. And this is exactly how our minds work, okay? What year did uh, Columbus discover America? How do you remember that? 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean. That's another mnemonic. All right, we've got loads of the, the wives of Henry VIII. How did they? What happened to them? Exactly. All of these are mnemonics. These help us structure difficult to remember stuff like declarative knowledge into what we call procedural knowledge, which is an easy way of putting stuff into order. So this is what we call declarative knowledge in psychology. Okay. Why call it simply facts when you can have, create something that's quite impressive sounding in meetings, which is declarative knowledge? We're really bad at this as humans, okay? We're really bad at remembering dates. All of that kind of stuff's really, really challenging for us, okay? So anytime you see anybody in your users doing this, they're trying to remember declarative knowledge, and it's hard. So we convert everything into what um, psychologists call procedural knowledge, which is a series of steps, one, two, three, four, okay? The steps allow us to offer a framework around the stuff we're working in. Never eat shredded wheat is an easy element and an easier thing to remember. So we create sequences of stuff. And that, this is how our brain is wired, around procedural knowledge of sequences, not around facts. Okay? This is why passwords are so flipping awful, because, again, they are classic declarative knowledge. What's the most common password in the world? 
Right, that's us attempting to create procedural knowledge from that. Oh, oh, there's the word password. I must write the word password here. That's us doing that at scale. Okay, we're, we're rubbish at this. In fact, here's an example of it. Do you recognize these two unlock patterns of phones? There's an Android on the left, an Android on the right, and a iOS on the left, yeah? You know how to unlock Android phone? How does it work? Yeah, you do a shape, yeah, like that, exactly. And iOS, you type in a number, okay? Which type of knowledge is the... Uh, iOS one, so remembering a number. Is it declarative or procedural? Yeah, so I used to be a primary school teacher, so if I get a bit like that, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, this is declarative knowledge. Remembering a number is declarative, because it's a bit harder to do. Ever forgotten your PIN number for your cash machine or your PIN number for your phone? Happens. Sometimes if you go and you, you go to the cash machine, you can remember it. And again, that's because we are much better at procedural knowledge, which is a series of steps to go through to do it. So you go, what's your, what's your n number on your phone? You're thinking, oh, where's my number on my phone? But if you sort of go through the steps of doing it, you're converting that declarative knowledge of the number into procedural knowledge of the steps. That's how we operate. All right? Which is why Android is much better, because step one reminds us of step two, reminds us of step three, four, and five, and six. The sequence is inbuilt into the design. Incredibly clever. And that's from a psychological point of view why that one is better. All right? We know it's better, but that's why it's better. So the problem is, though, where do 95% um, of uh, um, Android patterns start in the UK and US and Europe? Left. Top left. Yeah. And in Hebrew-speaking countries and Arabic-speaking countries? Right. Top right. Why? Because they read, yeah, we, we're taught in the UK to read from left to right. In the Arabic and um, Hebrew, they're taught from, to read the other way. Again, okay. culturally has a huge impact on the way procedural knowledge works for us. Okay, there's the psychology behind that stuff. All right, so back to Wikipedia. So Wikipedia redesigned this bad boy in 2000, late 2010. Well done, Wikipedia. Good job. We all know it's a long time coming. Um, and what was interesting about Wikipedia is, again, if we think about how search works, there is a procedural step and a process involved in search. Okay? We break all of these interactions down into small individual steps so we know how to use the website. Right. First thing we do is, we, where do you go looking for the search box on a website? Top right. That's the first thing we do. Okay? Procedural knowledge tells us, oh, we go to the top right. So we go to the top right to look for the search box. <clears throat> Not there. Problem, Wikipedia. What are we looking for? Secondly, what's the next thing we look for? What's a big indicator of something is, is search? What do we look for? Yeah, like an empty, empty box has typed something in, okay? Part of the problem with sites like Twitter is they've got two boxes, one of which is search and one of which is enter your latest update. If you ever type something in the wrong box, that's this going wrong. Yeah, we look for the top right, we look for a text box. We look for a button which normally says search. That's the third <laughs> thing we do. Really simple. This is a procedural knowledge flow. This is what we expect to happen, all right? Great stuff, really straightforward stuff. You all instinctively know this to be true. Here is the psychology backing it up. Procedural knowledge tells us step one, which reminds us of step two, which reminds us of step three. Anytime we change any of this stuff, we screw it up for our users. These are what we in psychology call an axiom. And an axiom, like the search, top, search being on the top right and being designed like that, is a statement or proposition which is regarded as being established, accepted, or self-evidently true. A shared truth is an axiom. And it's different from a design pattern. It's different from a design system. It's an axiom that we all agree to be true. Very, very different, okay? Other design axioms. Logo on the top left-hand side of the page. What, what, what happens when you click, click that logo? There we go, the home page. Design axiom. Pretty much all of our users will know that to be true. Where do we put navigation on the website? Where does that go? Top, where? Well, across the middle or sometimes down the left-hand side. Yeah, I mean, Wikipedia, but basically, design axiom set in that stone. So if I, again, I'm looking for a particular page like the Contact Us page, oh, I'll go and have a look in the navigation for it. I go to the navigation expecting it to be there in that position because that's what I'm used to, and I look for the word Contact Us in the navigation. All right, other things. Where does login go on the website? Where do you start a login procedural knowledge journey? Top right, very good. Yeah, it goes up there. Good, you all instinctively know this stuff. Procedural knowledge tells us to be true. All right, it goes up there. Cart, basket, where does that go? Yeah, top right, yeah, yeah, it does. Um, what about the logo for a cart or a basket? What should it be? Yeah, and what type of logo should it be? Cart or a basket, yeah, that makes sense. Something like this. So that goes on the top right-hand right side. All right, uh, language. Where does language go on the website? Language selector. 
Top right, yeah, this is, this is it's getting full up there, isn't it? And yeah, these are the sorts of things we expect from a language selector. So both so far, we've got four things up there. We've got our search, our shopping cart, our language selector. Anyway, you get the point. All of these things are instinctively inbuilt to all of us because we are great designers. Procedural knowledge tells us the steps we need to go through, all right? So what psychology can do is give us a framework to talk about an interaction design model. So people can't go, oh, let's be innovative and put the search on the different, don't be innovative, because people won't be able to use it. Use psychology and procedural knowledge to tell people where it should go. Don't innovate in terms of interaction design. That's a losing strategy. We'll talk about innovation a bit more in a minute, but from an interaction design point of view, don't do it, okay? Anytime you break an interaction, you annoy people. Again, that feeling when you go to a website and you're looking for search and you can't find it, how do you feel? Annoyed, don't you? I want to punch this website in the face, especially if you're tired or you're distracted or you're hungry. We've got a lot of choice. All of this stuff mounts up when we break it. And we break it because we want to do something fancy or different. All right, back to Wikipedia. Do you want to see the redesigned search box from Wikipedia? Yeah? <sighs> Built it up, haven't I? There it is! Woo! So it's in the right place. Well done, Wikipedia. It's got the word search in it. What's missing? Where's the button? Have you ever seen user research? I've done lots of user research where people, both on mobile, on desktop, right, okay, I'm going to the search box, type something in, right, uh, get my tracker pad, right, where's the button? And I hit the button. They go back to their trackpad to hit the button to do it, don't they? Same on mobile, they'll just type it in, right, get rid of the keyboard, right, finger, search. See, there's all the time in user research. So when you take the button away, that's, there's nowhere to go. Our users have not got that next step in the procedural knowledge journey, so they go, whoa, I'm freaked out by this, I don't like it. What, what, how, how do most of you, how would you submit a search here if you just type something in? How would you do it? Yeah, enter, right, you're not like the most of the general population, you're absolutely right. And people who design Wikipedia assumed that they were. All right. It's better though, isn't it? It's better than it was before. We agree with that? The icon, is that any good? Ah, it's moments, I mean, anybody used a magnifying glass recently? It's not the best, um, but it's not bad. Search would be better. All right. So yeah, Wikipedia relaunched. Um, and guess what happened? Did users love it? No, they hate it. Users hate change. 97% of all people want the search back on the left side. Want this to be fixed. Says so regular user George Schultz. Search box on the left, please, left, please. These are all of the feedbacks. This is, I love this. Next time you redesign something, don't write a blog post saying why we redesigned it. Here's our emotional and creative journey and all the lattes that we drank while we... Don't! Because all it encourages people to do is go, oh, shut up. You broke my existing procedural knowledge journey. So everybody who's using Wikipedia day in, day out, Wikipedia told them and taught them how to search, where to look for the search box they've learned from Wikipedia. The fact you have two buttons, one of them which is really handy, which takes you directly to the right thing that's there, Wikipedia broke because they got rid of the go button. They broke some existing procedural knowledge for people like George Schultz, so they hated it. So what does that tell you about your next redesign? Even if it's far better in terms of interaction design, you spent all this time and effort following procedural knowledge journeys, you worked out all the design axioms, you did all this stuff. What, how do you think people are gonna feel about your next redesign? They're gonna hate it. They're gonna hate it. No matter what, okay? Sorry, God, I'm full of bad news. At least I'm doing it with a friendly smile on my face. People will hate it. So what do you do? Anybody heard the apocryphal story of eBay? I worked at eBay for a while, I'm not be sure if this is true. They changed their background colour. It used to be like this lemony yellow colour. And they then changed it slightly from yellow to white. They went from yellow to white overnight. People hated it! And um, people hated it. And they came back and um, all the same sort of response. And eBay were like, oh, sorry. Yeah, users, we'll change it back from yellow to white. I'll never change it back. They changed it back from yellow to white. I'll throw from white to yellow, back to the way it was, because people were saying, oh, you've, eBay's lost its soul. All this white space means that the soul of eBay's gone. They changed it back. So one clever developer wrote a tiny bit of script that day by day, bit by bit, changed it from, lime ye from lemon yellow to white over the course of three months. Did users notice? No. Change bit by bit. I don't know if that story's true. eBay, people at eBay, I heard, never, nobody could back it up. But anyway, hey. So... This brings us to certain interaction design methodologies that are complete change, like this thing. Is this a good idea based on what I've told you? No. There is no single, none, procedural on this journey that starts with the hamburger menu. Okay? It doesn't start anywhere. If I'm looking for the contact us, I go to the navigation. This isn't navigation. 
Okay? If I'm looking for things like the About Us page, I'm looking for the word About. I'm not looking for the hamburger menu. All of the procedural knowledge journeys I talked about don't involve the hamburger. They never do. Here is the psychology you need to stop using this thing. Okay? I know Tobias said it's a bad idea. Here is why it's a bad idea. All right. How are you all doing? How am I doing for time? It says two minutes down here. That can't be right. How am I doing for time? I, I've got two minutes left, haven't I? I've got, I've, got, I've got eight minutes left, according to my watch. Yeah, that's fine. All right, then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's an easy thing to do from up here. All right, let's talk about some stuff, then. All right, so let's talk about... I, talked, I promised you a little bit of the larger, wider picture. We've got eight minutes to talk about the wider picture. So, um, anybody know this cafe? Les, les, les Dumagotes? My French is terrible. It's a beautiful, beautiful cafe. In Paris, oh, it's lovely, isn't it? Look, you can sit outside, have a coffee. I think Hemingway drank here. Hemingway drank everywhere in Europe. He, he probably also drank here. It's a wonderful, wonderful cafe. Now, they have a problem here, or they did have a problem. Um, and they, they figured out a way to solve this problem. They were, they were struggling because Brits and Americans and Australians were leaving without paying the bill. <laughs> Kept happening all the time. Why? Because we're different, yeah, because we like to drink a lot of beer and walk away. Are we inherently less honest than the French? Yeah. Careful now. Yeah. <laughs> we're not, of course we're not. No. The challenge was, uh, in fact, how, do you, how would you go about ordering a coffee? What are the steps you go through to order a coffee at this place? What would you do? So you, you go in, you stand there. What, what was the first thing you do at this place? <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, click your fingers. You, you'd ask the waiter for a seat, wouldn't you? Because look, hey, look, there's a design axiom, which is a waiter that tells you, oh, I've got to go and ask the waiter to be set, sat down. There's menus there which are design actions that tell you to hold on a minute, wait, before you get to sit down. You go and you sit down. Waiter comes, doesn't he? Brings you the menu and you order. What happens after that? You wait. What happens then? They bring you your stuff. Then what do you do? Drink your coffee, don't you? Then what do you do? Ask for the check and you, and you, yeah, you pay your bill and off you go. So you pay for your bill after you've drunk your coffee. Problem is, is the majority of us Brits, Americans, and Australians were taught to drink coffee by these folks. All right? These are Starbucks. What's the model at Starbucks? So you go in, you join the line, what do you do? Order, Order and then you pay. That's the important difference. Okay, you've paid. So your brain is looking at the model of how you use a coffee shop, which is the Starbucks model, the mental model of how a Starbucks works. So you look at the Starbucks and go, oh, I get this, it's one of those. There's a counter, therefore I must line up. You see a line of people, automatically you line up. That's what Brits do. You order, and they say, oh, your money, and you paid. Again, you take that model of how a Starbucks works, that mental model of a Starbucks, and you apply it to here, it's going to break. Because, again, you've, you assume you've paid because you're so used to, in the Starbucks world, paying at the point when the coffee is given to you, or even beforehand when you order the coffee. Again, you've ever been in that situation, you've ever done that, you sort of walked away and gone, oh, I'm paid. Ah. Yeah, a few of us have. I've definitely done it. We get the point. That's what's going on. And this is a very powerful thing in psychology called mental models. And we build mental models of the world around us. And we take these mental models and we apply them to new and novel situations. Okay? They're big, large-scale ways that the world works. And we go, oh, I know, it's one of these. It's, it's, it's a Starbucks or it's a Parisian cafe. I get it. We take the model and we go somewhere else and we use it. Um, so here's, here's, here's a good example. This is a, a lift. You all with me here? Oh, a lift, run into the lift, quick, it's open, let's go, let's shut the door. Great, off we go. Oh, uh, right, let's press the button here. Oh, ah. Everybody in a lift like this with no buttons in it? Yeah, freaky as hell, isn't it? You're in there and you're like, oh my God, there's no buttons in this lift. What do I do? What should you have done? You should have got out. What should you have done beforehand? Typically, there's a thing outside where you type your floor in and it tells you which lift to go to. It's like trying to be all efficient and stuff. So you go in and you're like, oh, there's no buttons. Oh, I should have got out. Anyway, this breaks your mental model. Because we all know, we've all got a mental model about how lifts work. As you go in, you look for the panel on the left or the right, you press the button and off you go and you're there. This fundamentally breaks your mental model because there's no buttons. How do you feel when there's no buttons in the lift? Feel good? <laughs> oh, no. It's that feeling like walking away in a Starbucks without paying or in a prison cafe without paying. It's that same feeling that, um, so actually, it's interesting, when Starbucks first opened in Paris, guess what French people did? What did they do? They went in, and they sat down and went, oh, God, what's, what's all the fuss about? The service is terrible. There's no waiters here. Wait, wait, wait. Again, they took the mental model of how a Parisian cafe worked and applied it to Starbucks. The same happens to you when you go into a lift and don't see any buttons. Oh, my God, the button's gone. What do we do? 
you feel freaked out. And interestingly, another fact I learned about lifts recently is you know the, the, the um, closed door button in lifts? All lifts built in the last 15 years, that button doesn't work. It's in there to make you feel better, like you've got some control. That button doesn't work. <laughs> Sorry to break that for you. So the same is true in New York of all the crossing buttons as well. None of them work, but they make you feel better about life, don't they? Anyway, how do we do this stuff and how do we use this stuff in digital design? So taking it back to digital design, finally. We've got this question. Let's go away for the weekend. Right? We've all done this. You've all been on holiday before. So bringing it back to the stuff in the world that we know. Anybody here work for a travel company, actually? Anybody in from Expedia in the house? Oh, it's good. I'm slagging off Expedia in a minute. I've done lots of work with Expedia, so they're, they're quite used to me doing that for them. Um, right, let's go over for the weekend. We make a number of choices when we go away for the weekend, okay? We decide what type of holiday it's going to be. Is it a beach holiday, a city holiday, a ski holiday, or a spa holiday, all right? Or what kind of holiday do you fancy? Oh, I fancy the beach. I fancy a bit of culture. Let's go to a city. All familiar with those kinds of conversations. Oh, when should we go away on holiday? I know, let's go away the first week in July. No, maybe the second. Is that school holidays? When's half term this year? All these conversations are conversations you have when you're booking a holiday. And typically, if you're going away for the weekend, you might choose the first weekend and maybe the third weekend. We can't go on the second weekend because we've got so-and-so coming over for dinner. Yeah, all right. First or the third weekend in July. That's the sort of thing we're going to look at. What day of the week does the weekend start? Thursday? Friday? When do weekends end? Monday? Sunday? All of these questions are things that we go through when we're booking a holiday. And the weekend, you seem quite defined thing. It's not. It's from a Thursday to a Friday. How many nights? Two nights, three nights. You get the point. School holidays. Where? When you're deciding where to go, what's the number one factor that most people use when they're deciding how, how to, um, where to go on holiday? Yeah, distance. I want to travel two to three to four hours, either by flying or by car. You decide how you're going to do that, and you say, right, this is our window of travel. If you're American, you're going to you'll happily travel 16 hours. If you're a Brit, maybe an hour and a half if you're lucky. You get the point. Maybe you'll do three hours. These are all the decisions we go through when we're booking a holiday. This is our mental model of how booking holidays works. These are the steps we go through to book a holiday. This is the mental model that we use to book a holiday. All of the steps. And they're quite complicated. But what happens when this stuff, so you know, this is the sort of response we get. What happens when this stuff hits the real world? So we go, let's go to the beach, fly maybe three hours on the first or second weekend in July. Here's the reality of a travel website. We've got a search box which says city or airport, flying from to city or airport, departing DDMMYYY. All of the problems that we talked about before. So what day does the weekend start? Thursday, Friday? First, second week in July? Can you do that from DDMMYYY? No. Can you travel by three hours? So I want to go somewhere that's three hours away. Can you do that from Expedia? No. First or second week in July? Can you do that from Expedia? No. This is the fundamental problem with some of the things that we've talked about in terms of interaction design. The procedural knowledge journeys here are fantastic on this website. The search button is in exactly the right place. It's exactly the right color. The words are in exactly the right place. The problem is, is the user experience and the mental model of all of this isn't there. They've developed their own mental model of how travel should work, and they've chosen the easy bits. So if Expedia wanted to innovate, how could Expedia innovate? Any ideas? What would be a great widget they could have on their homepage? Yeah, travel for three hours. Those are good. Any other ideas? A selector for beach or ski or city. Is it here? No, it's not here. That is true innovation based on psychology and based on user experience. If we take the mental model of how something works, you can use that mental model to innovate. That's where the ideas are going to come from. Innovation is not putting the search box on the left-hand side of your screen. That isn't. This is innovation, is using mental models to do this stuff. So I got quite excited because um, Expedia has got this thing called Things to Do here. I was like, oh, yes, they're finally doing the ski drive thing that's there. Brilliant ski beach stuff. And I, I clicked on it. Here's, here's, uh, here's Things to Do. Uh, oh, wonderfully, it's another destination, destination city, Dady M-M-Y-Y. It's exactly the same thing. This is not suggesting holiday in any way, shape, or form to anybody. Dreadful stuff, Expedia. I said that term at the time, and they... Didn't ask me back to do any more work with them. But other sites are doing better. This is Booking.com. Booking really kind of getting to the grips of the bottom of this stuff. And their stuff matches mental models much, much better. And what's interesting about the two companies, who's doing better in the, uh, in, in the world at the moment, Booking.com or Expedia? Who's on the rise? Booking. Who's on the fall? Expedia. Expedia. That's why. 
looking at going fundamentally back to the mental model of how we do it to grab ideas to put into the digital stuff that they do. Expedia ARM. Expedia are just making their buttons a different color. All right? Interaction design can help us with that stuff, and types of knowledge can help us get there. But on the whole, user experience is a better way of taking a big step back and looking at going, well, what ideas can we grab from how our users do this stuff in the real world to better improve our design? So if you remember one thing from my stuff today, it's this. Never eat shredded wheat. All right, it's really bad for you. Just joking, don't. But what psychology can do is it can help you with a framework in terms of the world that you want to work to. So rather like, was it Tobias earlier on? So was it Tobias quoting himself earlier on? I can't remember who it was. I'm also quoting myself. This is a quote from me. A designer who doesn't understand psychology is going to be no more successful than an architect who doesn't understand physics. It does fit into 141 characters with Mr. Joe in there as well, if you so want to do it. <laughs> I'm going to go anywhere until you all tweet it. I'm not. But you get the point. Understanding psychology can give you the procedural knowledge to... Procedural knowledge flows to better design interactions. It can help you advocate and design interactions in a better way. It, the user, it can help you understand the mental model to redesign that user experience to understand on a much larger scale where opportunities are for innovation. So psychology can give you both of those things, which are incredibly transformational for you as web designers. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, for your time today.